So hello everyone, my name is Ellie Johnston. I'm the Climate and Energy Lead at Climate Interactive. I'm here with Drew Jones, uh, the co-director of Climate Interactive. Also joining from our team, we have Yasmin Zahar and Janet Tchaikovsky, and there might be a few others from the team uh, who have jumped on as well. We're so excited to have you all here. Uh, as has become a little bit of a tradition for these uh, weekly meetings, we'll start with a big global hello. Uh, so, um, and the count of three, we're going to unmute everyone and everyone say hello in your favorite language. Um, and then after you do that, we're all going to go back on mute. Okay. And, uh, hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. 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 Hello, hello, hello. Great, great. <laughs> hello from Cairo. Perfect. Excellently executed, everyone. Great job. So wonderful to hear your voices, uh, however briefly. And uh, let's go to the slideshow um, and get started. So today on the uh, webinar, what we will be covering uh, is, I'll just give a quick uh, introduction. And then um, Drew is gonna take over and run us through some different scenarios. So um, along the way, as you may be familiar, um, use the chat if you have any questions. Um, people from our team can uh, type in different responses. We'll save um, some for the question and answers period at the end. However, if you have something long, um, you're thinking about a specific question, um, you can go to support.climateinteractive.org and you can file a ticket uh, that goes to us, goes to our team, and we can get back to you with more specific details. So if you have something more than maybe a sentence long question, definitely reach out to us uh, on the support platform. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, what we'll cover today is just uh, um, some different scenarios. So we just, uh, last week we released the module four of the different, all the different slider videos. I hope you enjoyed those. And today we're gonna kind of walk through like, okay, when would you use different kinds of sliders or graphs and when, and just talking about different cases and I'm really excited to get your input and ideas and uh, see what we might be able to come up with together on that. Then uh, we'll also, as part of that, have some breakout group discussions. So get ready for that uh, later on in the session. And then we'll also have time for some question and answer period. Uh, if you have questions that have come up during the videos as you've gone through the material or questions that come up during the session, uh, write them into the chat and we'll flag them and come back to them later. And just as we've done for the past uh, few weeks, if, if you have time at the end and you wanna stay after the hour, uh, connect with other people or just um, listen to more question and answer, just hang on. Um, we'll have breakout groups. And this week we're gonna try doing breakout groups and different sector topics. So if you wanna stick around and say meet other educators, we'll try and offer an opportunity for that. It's just informal, um, just if, if you're interested and have the time. Um, all right, next slide. So also what we're doing uh, alongside this whole, all these different live sessions is of course that you need to lo log in to learn.climateinteractive.org. And we have so much content there. Uh, videos and quizzes and all kinds of things like that uh, for you to check out. And so what we have just done today is release module five. And what this covers is all these different kinds of inroads dynamics. We're really excited about this one because this, these are some of the kinds of um, overarching concepts that can tie together. Okay, well, what's going on here? And it can help provide explanation for a lot of different common things that we see coming up within uh, inroads and trying to explain different scenarios. Uh, the other component to this too is uh, last week I mentioned this, um, but we have a challenge. Um, so the challenge that is the same as last week is to find somebody, anyone, maybe it's somebody you live with, a family member, a friend, um, colleague, whoever it could be, and sit down and just show them inroads. Practice walking through the different um, uh, ways in which you might set up an experience with them. It, this, is, this is a way to just get yourself practicing and sharing it and then ask them, how did it go? Um, I saw over in the community space, some people have already started 
uh, to do that. That's so awesome to see and uh, have been sharing their experiences. So look for the challenge and uh, take part in it. Um, from here, I'll turn it over to you, Drew, and uh, you can take it from here. Great. All right, everybody. So happy you're here. So happy you're engaging with us in leading powerful climate action around the world using this stimulator to address climate and climate-related equity. Um, we're so thrilled that you're digging into these videos and then joining us here to go in a level deeper. And so we have some fun stuff that we're going to do. But first, I kind of want to hear what fun you're having with the overall training so far. So you've been watching videos, you've been trying things or doing the exercises or reading this or whatever. So please go to Poll Everywhere. What's been your favorite part of this? Uh, what's your favorite video, your favorite topic or the favorite moment you've had so far as you've engaged with this? And of course, that's the key. This is a flipped classroom. You're out there, you watch the videos. We don't waste time on that. We, wait, we bring up people together to talk about the experiences. Watching Beth Sawin's TED Talk on multi-solving. I love it too. Well said. Feeling empowered. Love the quizzes. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, Clara, uh, Janet, and you guys. I learned a lot from the carbon price video, renewables video, learning how to interact with audience, learning how to interact. We have a lot more of that in the whole module on facilitation. The discussions and breakout rooms, the quizzes. Again, oh my gosh, some of our team are going to love reading that learning about how the sliders interact. There's gonna be a whole thing on systems thinking with the sliders, small subgroup mutual discussion, the quizzes, the quizzes, what? People love the quizzes, Ellie, can you believe this? I really like these uh, that's, videos. That's, that's great. Yeah, slow <laughs> we, we, have, we have worked hard on really, the quizzes. <laughs> really usable script. Enjoyed the breakout chats, materials are valuable. Explore as a detective the data and possible results, watching videos of other ambassadors. Oh, we should get more videos of other ambassadors about how to be a facilitator. I like the breakout rooms, great quizzes. Show me what I missed. That's like five for the quizzes, Ellie, who knew? Love how the model connect people with the nature of energy. That's cool. Multi-learning, self-paced, challenging quiz. 10 minute abbreviated version of En-ROADS for participants of the Explorers Club. Climate week, yeah. 10 minute workshop, you can do it in 10 minutes. Drop the mic, understanding the dynamics, cheaper energy leads to more demand, better understanding of actions, the greatest leverage, the community. So helpful to learn about high impact and low impact, learning about the scenarios, sparking my interest in learning about sustainability, understanding the data, all the materials are, wow, this is so lovely to see. Appreciate the quizzes. <laughs> That's six. The amazing team. Oh, thank you guys. Aw. Oh, again, the quizzes. That's not you, Janet. You're not in there, Janet, saying that over and over. You wouldn't do that. Slide Hi. and simulator. Okay. Fantastic. They're making you crazy. Getting, get back, get over again on the read materials and read more and then take them again. The interactivity. Fantastic. Join the weekly meetings. Well, we love having you here too. The quizzes and discussions. Oh my God, that's eight. Unbelievable. Integration. Okay, we're going to go to the next question. Reading the community page. Yeah, people are really stepping up and asking really good questions. Um, and in the support page, George Vine, you asked a really good question of support about the clean electricity standard that has our team working hard behind the scenes to answer you well. We love the quizzes. One of a kind training. A quiz is again, the operation of the model. There's a nod to that. I'm an engaging, passionate speaker. Oh, thanks. Great teaching strategy. The notes, Janet, L enjoying all the materials. Okay, this is fantastic. Here's another good question. What are you looking forward to? We're building more, you know that there's more coming. Uh, maybe you're still hungry. What could be next that you'd really like to see? Uh, you know what's queued up, because I think you've probably seen that the, the contents of what's coming, but you're like, oh my gosh, we're in week three. I'm waiting for week five because I'm looking for this. Sea level rise slide. Sea level rise slide. 
if that person had more to say about what you're curious there, we, we'd read it, we'd be how to deal with skeptics. We're gonna do a little bit today on that. Finding out a games version of the presentation. Ellie did a whole section module on that. My head looks with, could there be more? What? <laughs> what are the hardest questions to answer? There's a whole training on tough questions. Multi-solving in equity. The next series is that. Drawdown. How, we, Ellie, we don't have something on that. Putting it together, dynamics of the system and how to use the sliders. The Kaya graphic, more on the Kaya graphic. I wonder, I'm excited about- We've got a video on that to this week. Great, so yeah, there's a video on that exact topic that was released this morning, the Kaya video. Go watch it. The skeptics, system dynamics, climate action simulation game, ocean temperature and impacts on ocean life. Would love if we were trained on pole everywhere. Is there such a <laughs> thing? We huh. should look into that. That's a good idea. <laughs> How to use pole everywhere. I would be interested in case studies. Climate change effect on the Himalayas. Agriculture. How to elicit responses from a shy audience. How to deal with skeptics. Okay, this is great. Um, so there's a whole section on facilitation. Advanced facilitation. That's coming out, what, week seven? More information of graphs. Customization of the model for specific countries with specific, oh, wouldn't that be great to have those models? A games version. Yes, we have a whole training on the games. More hints on facilitation. Okay, more maybe confidence building. All right, we're gonna move on. These are really good, but we can read them all later. Um, more on tough questions. Okay, well, based on all that, what many of the ones that you're talking about are in the newly released video. So right here, all of this just dropped this morning. All of these different stories of capital stock turnover. The person who asked about system dynamics, these are the system dynamics principles that answer 90% of the questions people have about why did the model do that? I don't understand why the red line went up. I thought it would have gone down. The answer 90% of the answers are one of these 10 things here in this section. It's about economies of scale or the bathtub or Kaya or the multiple sliders paradox, which are all new videos that you can watch at the end of this webinar. That's what we're going next. But you just watched this amazing series that um, right here, the simulator tour where we went through each section of the sliders and explained what's going on here, what's going on here, how to explain it. And we thought what would be interesting to do is not to go through that. You can watch that offline. Go think about situations that you run into that Ellie and Yazzie and Janet and Caroline and I, we've all run into where we have to pull out one of those sliders or one of the graphs, but it's not obvious. You know, when they say, hey, what if we have more wind and solar? You know what to do. You go move that slider, there's a video on it. What's not obvious are gonna be these seven challenges that I'm about to lay out where it's not really clear what to do to answer these kinds of questions. For example, here's a situation we run into all the time. Seems like someone in every group that I meet asks about eating vegetarian. How, how do I test that impact? Doesn't, there's no slider that says eating vegetarian. And this is all over. You may have read or heard Cowspiracy, the secret to sustainability. And I saw this number on their website, greenhouse gas emissions, 51% due to livestock, 51% of emissions. Well, seems like it's half the solution, right? Uh, there's a headline, cows, not coal, are the real climate change culprits. And these are some of the things that might motivate you, a, motivate a really legitimate question, which is what is the contribution? Um, Ellie, you and I were in Madrid at the UN negotiations and you get off the subway at the UN and there are these folks who say the fastest way to stop 80% of global warming. And these folks are at every negotiation, 80%. So those are exaggerations, but still the question remains, how 
to address that in En-ROADS. And the resource for this is going to be here in these videos and just really in this last section, we have a really nice um, tip that I think uh, was pulled together, notes on methane that Janet, you did based on the video. So there's some tips here, notes on methane and others, a video that talks through where Ellie explains it all. But here are some tips, mostly vegetarian diet. So there are gonna be three things that you'll want to engage people on and I'll, let's do it together. And the key thing is, when someone asks a question like, what about a vegetarian diet? Your goal is not to have an answer. Oh, it's 0.1 degree or it's 0.3 or whatever it is. This is a prompt for people to understand the system. And so the answer that's there is, well, this could help us in three major ways. If there are more vegetarian diets, and this is the, you might either say this or ask people, well, why does eating vegetarian help the climate and climate related equity? What, what is it? And so here there's the framing of three big impacts in climate in En-ROADS and you're gonna show all three. One of them is cows emit methane. So less directly emitting methane. Also, if we have less demand for cattle and have feeding less cattle, we don't need as much agricultural land and there would be less deforestation. We don't need to chop down as many trees to grow crops, to feed to cows and chickens and other things. And that would be an impact. But also because of the changes and the really intensive fossil fuel intensive way that agriculture is done, actually the, the transportation system would be somewhat more efficient. So you can go read a blog post and could someone on the team go look up uh, Skook's blog post on this topic so you can read all about it. But basically there are three things to show. And it's important to show which graphs. Pick the right graph. Don't just show energy when you're talking about something on this topic. Instead, you know, go under here and say, well, let's really look at what's going on with methane. So methane, those methane emissions. You have a chance to say, what is methane? It's like carbon dioxide, another greenhouse gas. It's a big deal. You could show this stacked graph that we've shown you before, where that blue area is methane. And then go over here and say, here's how we control methane and other. And it's not just going to be all methane and other, but you're going to say there are two areas. And agriculture and waste emissions is one of them. You can read about it here. But what we fought, saw, Scoop Jones on our team saw that we need to change this to negative 20. There was an FAO study that thought this is about how much methane would be reduced if there was a certain set of diets. It's called the Lancet diet. And you could quote that from the blog post, 20, think how much is it going to be, run your mental model. We're not going to take the time to go have you estimate like in other meetings, but 20%, okay, how much is that? Okay, there it is. That is a real dent in emissions. So watch the blue line depart, methane emissions would be lower. Look over on the right, you can see the squeeze of the blue area as we have it go down less emissions, about 0.1 degree. Did it save the world? Is it 80% of the solution so far? No. Did it help? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's not where it ends. What we also saw was, well, we would have less deforestation because we don't need to chop down the trees to grow the food to feed the cows. And what we saw here was that it was a 1.5% is it negative 1.5? Let's see, negative 1.5%. I hope I did this right. Um, 1.5, let me see if it's, it is uh, negative 1.5, negative 1.5. Run your mental model, a little decrease to those emissions. And I'm gonna change this to, here we go with, net carbon removal. I'm sorry, I'm moving too fast. Net forestry emissions. It's all, oh, there it is. So if it were this, and if it went to negative 1.5, 1.5 and reduced, there's a small reduction. It doesn't quite change it to 0.1, but that's another contribution. And then also 
Transportation, Scoot calculated that it would, not electrification, but uh, improved efficiency, 0.5% would go to 1% and then a little bit less. So you put the three together, you teach people that there are three big impacts and it doesn't save the day, but it makes a contribution. And as you know, every 0.1 helps. However, there is a lot of exaggeration about the contribution of vegetarian diets. Now, mind you, there are other things with manure management that can be done, et cetera, and feeding the cows, different stuff, but um, there's a contribution. All right, there's one of them. Let's do a few more, and then I'm gonna get your prompts about this. This is another one that we hear a lot. A friend of mine said that the world, that, that really is that there's emissions and removals. So the world's really focused on reducing emissions, but isn't removals half the solution, right? That's the other half. We need to stop emitting emit less, but also remove more. How do you explore that? And I pulled this little diagram, the other solution to the climate crisis. What does one show here? And I'll do this one real quick, and then I'm gonna ask you for some of your prompts about it or about similar challenges. And here we are. The key thing, again, find the graph that tells the story well. This one does not. We happen to put the one that does up here in our list of 12 favorite graphs. These are the graphs that we go to the most, and it happens that CO2 removals is one of them. So what you're gonna do when someone says, I've heard about carbon dioxide removal, and you say, yes, it could help, let's explore it. Encourage you not to just go click this on the main screen, because what that's gonna do is change five different types of carbon removal. But there's no policy in the world that would suddenly increase all five different types that are out there. Really, it should be considered one by one and ask, well, what are you proposing to do or what seems the most possible within these ones that have not yet been invented to scale? They seem to work, to work in pilot sites, but we have not pushed this to scale. So you'll wanna ask your friend who thinks and maybe half the solution, well, are you talking about bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, enhanced mineralization. And by the way, I just saw that Janet, you posted some really good materials up here in the website itself, notes on carbon removal. Like so that Ellie did a whole video on exactly this topic and included this diagram with the six different types right there in a really nice uh, diagram that you can use that's in the training. But you'll wanna say, which one do you want to explore? And then you can show what it'll do. And so right now, direct air capture, the US Congress is considering a bill that would give tax rebates to direct air capture. It's kind of, there's a lot of excitement, particularly amongst conservative climate advocates to, direct air capture. So if there were some, imagine what it might do. There it is It 3.6. It doesn't make a 0.1 degree benefit yet. However, you can also with this one go into the assumptions and say, well, we can change the assumptions if you wanna be more optimistic about how much. And so you can imagine that maybe it won't just be 2.8 gigatons a year but the Royal Society thought maybe it could be as high as five gigatons a year, but it's delayed. That gets us about 0.1 degree. So help them right size that guess. The friend said, maybe it's half the solution. And then you can take them through these different actions to say, it could help. It's not a silver bullet. And in no way is it half the solution. One way to show that it's not half is to go to the stack graph. If you go to the stack graph, you can see all the sources of what's going into the atmosphere above and then what's coming out below. You see that little silver, that silver area right there? That is what's being removed with this director capture. See the little silver area grow? There it is growing. So it's not, there's false equivalency to say it's half. If all of that is going in, this much is coming out and we can imagine others adding to it, but still in no way 
is what's being pulled out through these measures competing 50% with all that's going in. That's why there is a predominant focus and there must be a predominant focus on reducing emissions and using carbon removal as a way to supplement and help and contribute to getting to goals like well below two degrees, but it's not a 50-50 deal. All right, I've explained too, but I'm gonna start doing some and turn it over to you. And Ellie, anything that you would add or that's coming up in the quizzes, or excuse me, in chat, that would be good before moving on to the next one? Uh, no, this is great, keep going. Cool, all right, someone said skeptics, 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 what do we do? I've gotta say, I've run hundreds of workshops and I've never really had anybody be the skeptic kind of climate denier that you read on Twitter or in the internet in the way that you read it online. Um, people will often ask about what's going on and they'll ask for some clarifying questions, but you don't tend to get the kind of one that you see on the internet that much. That said, people will sometimes ask a question like this. I wrote it here is, someone told me that the fact that CO2 in the atmosphere leads to warming is much more in question than most people think. This is like CO2 collecting around the atmosphere may not lead to warming. They're saying they've heard that. Uh, maybe the scientists have gotten it wrong. What does En-ROAD say about this? And I did find an article. Scientists, climate, carbon dioxide doesn't cause global warming. So the first thing, and I tend not to assert this because everybody's heard it a thousand times, but it is true that 97% of the papers on this topic support anthropogenic, that humans are causing global warming through these emissions and that this does actually happen. So it is well established scientifically that this is true. Asserting that though doesn't really help this situation. So don't get into that, I'm right, you're wrong, doesn't work. Instead, I tend to like reframe and work with this a bit. Um, and the reframe it in a way that is constructive. So I had this once, um, it was particularly, well, it doesn't matter who it was, but um, so in this situation, where do you go? So. I want to be able to use En-ROADS to address these things. So here's how I tend to use En-ROADS to address this one. And what I do is I go here to temperature, show temperature over on the top right, um, and say, let's go to the assumptions and pull up the number, which is that exact parameter in the model that the person is asking about. We call it climate sensitivity. It is, is the climate warming sensitive to carbon in the atmosphere? And the way it's measured is if there was a doubling of pre-industrial carbon in the atmosphere. At pre-industrial, it was 270 parts per million. What if it goes up to 540? How much would temperature go up? Oh, many scientists have opinions about this. In our model, it's three. Now, if that article was right before and that it didn't cause warming, this number would be zero. That is, there's no warming. The climate sensitivity is zero. The climate is not sensitive to carbon in the atmosphere. So this is just some of the background. You can read here. This is the homework to do. Read what this says. See, where did the number come from? Why do they say it's three? What are the suggestions of what the range is? But then you say the fact that carbon in the atmosphere causes warming is not at all in debate mm -hmm. among scientists. But there's a lot of debate about how much. What you're doing is you're reframing it. You're acknowledging the legitimacy of the person's point, but you're clarifying and reframing. You're saying it's not, it is true that it causes, everybody knows that. How much is up for debate? And so there's a lot of debate about that. And the range, the high confidence range is 1.5 to 4.5. So you can say some scientists think it's lower. And if it were lower, then the question is, what would we do differently? So what if instead of 
Three, it's lower and that the scientists were wrong. They were exaggerating that carbon in the atmosphere is gonna to lead to all this warming. They're just made a mistake. Then what would that do? Oh, then we're headed at more like 3.1 temperature. And watch the blue line, it, it would be lower. That would be the application. And then you could say, boy, that's great. <laughs> we're, we're headed at 3.1. And you could say then, what would that mean for climate policy? Oh, we need a lower carbon price and a little less energy efficiency and less deforestation cutting that thing to get to two. Fantastic. We still need to do that stuff. We may need to do a little less. The point is, what is the policy implication of it, given that there's some uncertainty about it? So in the same way, you could go back here and say, well, in the same way, the permafrost methane release could be more. The albedo feedback effect, where less ice leads to less reflecting of the light up, and that could be stronger, excuse me, that that effect could lead to more warming than we thought. And this could be actually 3.5. It could be 3.5. So then we're headed to four. That is a tougher world. And then you would say, what would the application of that be? The key though is the reframing from not like there's no impact to there's a huge impact to there's some debate about how much. And we would love to think with you about different policies, given that there's some uncertainty there. It's a reframing on this topic. Anything you would add to that, Ellie, or others who face this one, this, this reframing idea? Um, no, I don't, I don't have anything to add on that. Um, but like you, Drew, I, it, 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 we talk, we see it a lot on the internet, but then as some people have pointed out in the chat too, um, there's studies out there that have um, found that we expect there to be more climate skeptics um, among our friends and family than there actually are. And so sometimes people will not even talk about climate change because they fear everyone's skeptical, but that's not actually the case. Um, yeah. So really fascinating. The stuff. reason we read so much about the skepticism, and this is well-documented, uh, like Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes is a great book on this, is that uh, companies out in the world have purchased ads and promotion of this idea to cast doubt on the legitimacy of climate science. So it's not on as much, but when it comes up, help people frame it well with this kind of thing. Okay, but now I'm gonna turn it over to you. I've given you three answers. Here's one, and we're gonna ask you in poll everywhere to come up with what you would show. So my kids are pushing their college to divest from fossil fuels. How would I show that up in En-ROADS? Um, what, how do we explore divestment? And for people not in the US where this is a big deal or what we're talking about is, well, yeah, divestment from fossil fuels. Right, maybe that's clear. So I'm curious, let's do it in, yeah, here in poll everywhere. Um, and not this one, I'm gonna say not that one either. Uh, let's do, Actually, I'm gonna show this last slide, sorry. What graphs would you show? What sliders would you move to help, when someone says, hey, what would be the impact of divestment? So I've put up another poll, please go to that site and you should be able to see it. What would you show, what sliders would you move to explore divestment? And of course, Slides on the left, coal, fuel, and gas. Maybe like a carbon tax? This would be a great quiz question. <laughs> Switch the fossil fuel sliders to stop new construction. So the sliders, you could tax it, you could stop new construction, coal, oil, natural gas sliders. Increase renewables. Now, increased renewables might be indirect. Carbon tax, coal. Further, slow further development of fossil fuel attraction. I would move the coal, oil, and gas sliders. Yeah, and so one note here, 
Like, this is a lot of the art of running these workshops is interpreting what people seem to be saying into the simulated world so it makes sense of it. It would be equivalent to a tax on coal, oil, and natural gas. Highly taxed coal, oil, and natural gas. Okay, carbon tax. And this is interesting to think, does a carbon price fit? And this isn't a question, do you like a carbon price? This is when people say divest, do they mean a carbon price? Electrification of transport. So how far away growth? So we like to interpret these words pretty literally. So folks that have said electrification and renewables, I would advocate that no, those would not be things that you would offer directly. Like, hi, I wanna divest. And you say, okay, I'm gonna move renewables or I'm gonna improve electrification. No, that would be a pretty different policy investment approach in the world. It's related, but it's not capturing that question. When capturing that question, we think of as two ways, maybe a third with carbon price. And the two ways, as many of you said as well, it shows up as a tax, as in it makes it more expensive for these companies. Basically, the companies, coal, oil, and gas companies, can't get capital as easily if people are not willing to own their stocks. So it is like a tax. Or you could think of it as if it spreads globally and is a huge movement, and that is the dream, of course, it could actually lead to lack of investment or cutting utilization of coal, oil, and gas. So let's try it. Um, now, mind you, you may not want to move all three because the divestment, the, when I hear it, I hear a lot of of oil first, but oil, oil and gas companies often are together, and then also some with coal. So the simplest would be to say, yes, divestment, coal, oil, and gas, it could show up in its milder form as just increasing costs and therefore would be a tax. So you would say, watch the brown area, watch what happens to coal. Oh, look at it shrink, temperature goes down. What about oil? If it got more expensive because of this divestment movement, watch what happens to the red area of oil shrink. Oh boy, it's a little bit less, 3.3. Now one note, I'm gonna give you a prompt for the amazing videos that just showed up today. Go watch, squeeze the balloon, squeeze the balloon. What happens when you have a balloon and you, it's kind of soft? a soft old balloon, you squeeze it in one area, what happens to the rest of that balloon? It gets bigger elsewhere, squeeze the balloon. So I'm gonna ask you, if we divest just from oil and coal, mentally simulate in this system, this interconnected, tightly coupled system, what are we gonna see with natural gas if we just do those two? What are we gonna see? Write in chat, I wanna see, if, yeah, like what happens to natural gas in this tightly coupled system, right in chat, some of you, because your mental models are getting so good. People are people are nailing it. Increase, oh, increase. Blow up. Natural Goes gas up. will increase. 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 Tamara, natural. Yeah. So it is a tightly coupled system. And go watch the video about this dynamic. I'm not going to explain it all right now. Watch the video. But you're right. If this is all we did, and this is not all that's being proposed, natural gas People still want energy. People still want electricity, less coal, less oil. Boop, up goes gas. Squeeze the balloon problem in this tightly coupled system. The demand is a little bit lower because of high prices, but that demand is still there. It's going to natural gas. Okay, that's just a little side point. Watch the squeeze the balloon video for an interesting system dynamic. Okay. But you're also going to tax gas. And so we get less gas. Now, what happened to renewables? The, the beautiful part of squeeze the balloon uh, is what we want here. What happens to renewables? And someone suggested renewables. Oh, less demand in the other areas. It encourages indirectly renewables. And so those are the three areas. And you also suggested wisely well, if it's spread around the world, what if we defunded the entire 
coal industry. And I'm gonna switch back here to my main view. And again, take the time to show the graph that really illustrates visually what's about to happen. Take the time, because right here you want people to see, watch the brown area, direct their eyes, look at the brown area. Oh, stop invest, stop building new coal infrastructure. A globally successful divestment movement would succeed at this, huge. A globally successful defund the oil industry Watch the red area and a globally successful. Now, mind you, this boy, how is the system going to react? I, I get nervous when I shut down all three and imagine how does the system react to all three? Stop building infrastructure. Wow. Huge contribution. We get a lot of solar, wind and solar here, a big contribution. So those are the answers. Less ta tax, coal, oil, gas, maybe shut down new investment. Um, the third, which, and I'll defer to someone, Ellie, you're a little closer to these civil society movements. Do they think of carbon price? Does carbon, when they say divest, are they, I hope they say carbon price. Does that count as divestment? Not really. Uh, I would say not, not really. And what, one point I would add here is when we think about the the effect of social movements on any of these sliders sometimes the way i'll characterize it is like how a social movement can make it so that the sliders are easier to pull you know if you yeah. have the political will if you have the momentum there then those sliders which we can sit behind our computers and just move all day long but in the real world how are they actually moving they're moving with lots of different kinds of actions and building that up so social movements are absolutely critical in all of the civil society organizations out there to making sure that we can actually drag those sliders uh, in the real world. Yeah, well said. And for the people who propose carbon price, um, that is typically a diff framed as a different policy input than divestment. Um, at all the marches, the people with the carbon price sign are different from the divestment sign. There are two approaches. Now, mind you, in a minute, you'll see they're complementary, so it's not one or the other. We'll see how they work together, but that's different, I believe. All right, so here's another challenge. When I think about sustainability, I think it much more broadly than climate, climate-related equity, and, and not just grandchildren in the 2050s. What? That's not inspiring to me. I want to help address inequity, injustice now. And I want to think about environmental justice and addressing environmental racism. What graphs and views should I show? Okay, now, of course, you know, Dr. Beth Sawin, someone mentioned her TEDx video, um, invented this term here at Climate Interactive. It is and the idea of the flower here, where we think about climate protection as the middle of it, but jobs and assets, food and water, resilience, climate, excuse me, energy industry, connection, health and well being. There is a whole training to drop in a week, Ellie, on this topic. Okay. So there will be abundant information about it. And you can go right now to the website and read about multi solving case studies, et cetera. And while you're playing around, how do you show it in En-ROADS? So, uh, you all have played around with this. So I'm going to go here. Don't type it yet. Clearing responses. So again, if someone said that statement, I think about these things as tightly coupled. What should I show? PM 2.5, air quality, uh, emissions, PM 2.5. Uh, air quality is implicated in one in 10 deaths around the world, PM 2.5, energy price. Can we show something about energy price and energy costs? The economic hardship in marginalized communities, a larger fraction of the money spent, household income goes to energy. How are these policies affect energy costs? Air quality, sea level rise, the impacts of climate change affecting people, air quality, cost of energy, 
fantastic. What would you show? Deforestation. What happens to the people living in those forests? What happens to those farmers? What happens to the people who depend on these forests for their livelihoods and lives? It's uh, great. These are super prompts. Let's go to them and try them in the simulator. All right, here's good old En-ROADS. So people mentioned PM 2.5. So if you haven't gone there yet, actually before going to that slider, I wanna just make sure you see the resource that is here. And when you talk about any slider such as coal, over here under the I button, Cassandra Breeze Ceballos wrote down here, potential co-benefits of discouraging coal. I encourage you to think of it in these two ways. Potential co-benefits, that is potential. We don't count on them. If we do things about coal, we don't necessarily get these co-benefits. We need to design for them, but they could be, here it is, reduced air pollution. Less coal mining reduces heavy metal drainage. These could be co-benefits. And the second is equity considerations. What are the questions we should ask as we design policies? So the main thing you can do is when you're running a workshop and someone says, oh, I'm thinking about something about coal, you can say, well, what do you think are some equity considerations? What do you think are some co-benefits you'd like to capture with any policy you put in place before you run En-ROADS and then run it in En-ROADS? You've seen us do that in our workshops. The prompts for your answers, because you may want to have answers, are here under the I button and on the multi-solving page. So here under deforestation, someone mentioned that. Big messages and down here, biodiversity, erosion, soil loss. So some prompts, talking points are right here for you to read. Okay, someone though did mention, let's talk about uh, PM 2.5 and air quality. And I'm gonna show that in the context of say, just like a carbon price because less coal, then we get to go down here to impacts, air pollution from energy. And this is such a beautiful point to get to show. We talked about not just helping the grandchildren. If we enacted a carbon price and anything else that keeps coal in the ground soon, look at what year air pollution goes down. Air pollution from energy, people, PM 2.5 emissions drops in 2022, 2022. This lack of a delay is very important in selling climate action. Think of the difference here between selling this as a benefit and something that people care about relative to saying, hey, everybody, we're going to electrify everything and promote some renewables, which we should do. And guess what? We're gonna see a lower temperature in the 2040s and 2050s. Some of these impacts are delayed. Air quality is not, that's really important. So when you're talking about equity, air quality is expensive and damaging to lots of people, talk about it. The second one though, is to be concerned about the cost of energy. And here with a really high carbon price, we could have significant increases in energy costs. So you wanna ask what happens to the revenue that gets collected? And how do we make sure that people are, we, we address particularly energy costs in marginalized communities. So this doesn't help the people whom we're, excuse me, hurt the people we're trying to help. So those are two framings, two ideas um, that you might consider. Ellie, a third before I move on to the next challenge. Uh, sorry, I'm lost in the chat. There's some great, <laughs> That's okay. uh, great questions, okay. so keep rolling. So here's, here's the next one. Okay, this one I'm gonna turn over to you too. Some of my friends and people in the environmental community say to deal with climate, we should focus on keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Other people, and it feels like it's different people this person is saying, talk about clean tech. How can we explore these views in En-ROADS? Are they all the same thing? Are they all just helping the climate? Or are there actually two things going on here? And is there a little bit of a policy debate that En-ROADS can help with? Um, I'm gonna go 
back to my poll. And I think here I had some, um, I had some other, let me go back. I'm gonna ask this poll question. So think about it. What would, how would you address this one? Here's the poll everywhere. Um, so first, what sliders do we move when keeping fossil fuels in the ground? And I'm gonna shift, frame this as a pretty clear distinction between the two. Some sliders for keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And then I'm gonna ask you a second question, which is which are the ones for clean tech? I did a whole, God, I went to the climate and energy funders meeting in, in uh, Miami, maybe three years ago, just to help build some peace between these two camps. Stop fossil fuel infrastructure, no new fossil fuel, stop oil and gas construction, carbon price, carbon price and reduce coal mining, greenhousing deforestation, not fossil fuels. This would be keeping carbon in the ground, but deforestation isn't keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Carbon pricing, carbon price, coal, oil, gas, you're nailing it. Stop infrastructure, okay. You're all exactly highly, well, you just wait with that last one, renewable energy, highly subsidized renewable energy is actually gonna be in the other camp. That is going to be clean tech because these strategies that I'm talking about with keep it, keep it in the ground says, similar to what we were doing 10 minutes ago, either taxing coal, oil, and gas, mind you, which one's powerful thing about it, look how soon it helps. And this timing, I keep back, keeping come at, I keep coming back to timing. It helps soon. See how fast that helps? And or um, stop building infrastructure. You could even take it another level. <laughs> you could say, no, no, it's not just not building new infrastructure. We're going to reduce the utilization of coal-fired power plants. That is. The plants exist, but they're not going to get used. They're just not going to get turned on. So watch how soon we can get this to drop. This, and if you ask someone really keep it in the ground, this is what we're talking about, right? And people do imagine this. What if we could have in 10 years, coal industry go down that much? This is what we're talking about with keep it in the ground. Coal, oil, gas directly either tax reduce investment, cut utilization, keep it in the ground. Now, mind you, even these policies, they don't get us all the way there, right? Like even these, and we can add in, even if we add in some action in land and other, other okay, not enough, not enough just on that side. Maybe you could push it, but probably not sufficient. However, then the second question to you is this. Uh, what sliders should we move to re represent clean tech? Another kind of camp, most, many people are in both camps, but sometimes these two do separate themselves some. Renewables, exactly, a new, like it's an alternative to fossil fuels. Alternative, energy efficiency and the technologies that could reduce demand no new, new net zero carbon, electrification, exactly. This doesn't go directly at the fossil fuel industry. This says we're gonna reduce demand. We're gonna create competition for you. Go and create alternatives, subsidize renewables. Exactly. Subsidize renewables, carbon zero, new zero carbon energy, absolutely. So this is all clean tech. And I'm going to test it here. Just, well, what'd you say? You said more renewables, more renewables, less coal. It does keep coal in the ground, but notice there is more of a delay. It takes longer if you go indirectly at the fossil fuels. It doesn't reduce them right away. It goes around them, creates competition, and over time reduces how much they get burned. New zero carbon energy, absolutely, that fits. Nuclear fits, electrification of all types and energy efficiency. So these are all actions which create alternatives 
tune using fossil fuels. One is like going right at it. The other one is going around it to create competition or reduce demand. Those are two approaches. Now, mind you, I'm gonna take that. And then even if we add in action on nature-based climate solutions, notice it can't do it all either. Maybe if you pushed it really, really hard, you could get closer to two. But the thing to say to that friend, going back to this question, and then I said to this big group of funders, is that we really can't think of this as an either or, and we probably shouldn't fight with each other too much between these two camps, because as you've seen, both are needed. That if you did this and add a carbon price and push it on coal, oil, and gas, well, guess what? You get down there and you can get all the way down towards two degrees, the two together. So I think there is opportunity for peace between the two. Now, what we're doing, again, not just what sliders, the sliders are all in the videos that you should go watch because they're so great. How do you interpret the conversation that's going on about equity, about climate denialism, about, you know, oh, maybe nature, excuse me, vegetarian eating or carbon removal, or in this case, these two camps. How do you interpret the conversation that's going on and use En-ROADS to both give them insights from the model, but better yet, prompt, clarifying, well-framed conversations between people. That's what you're doing with this. And I hope these suggestions are helping. All right, here's the last one. And this is gonna go into the breakout. Oh my gosh, is it noon, Ellie? Uh, it, is, one. it is where you are, yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, this is the last one. Okay, so what we need to do, Ellie, is we need to say, this is gonna be the question. I think we need to wrap up and gently give an opportunity for everyone who planned on 60 minutes of this to, uh, to leave and go back to whatever you had planned to do in three minutes, because we don't go over, we don't act as if it didn't, we only contracted with you for an hour. So we're gonna end and then we're going to continue, anyone who wants to stick around in two ways. We're going to prompt this question that you see right now ask you all to go to breakout rooms to talk about how you would answer it and come back. So I'd like to buy another 10 minutes for anybody who wants to stick around and you don't have to. We will no shame in just leaving the Zoom. Um, and also, then we're uh, actually, go ahead. We will send out the recording afterwards. I know there's yeah. some people asking about that right. um, that have to go to other things. So we'll send, we'll send that link to the recording right. and you can check it out later. And then we are actually gonna have a chance for you to do some breakouts where you just get to meet people like you're in the lobby of the conference hall, leaving whatever meeting there was. You're gonna chat with some people. You're gonna to get to meet people in your interest areas if you'd like to stick around. But if you don't wanna stick around, the key thing to say now is go watch those videos, take the quizzes that apparently everybody likes much more than we ever knew and engage with us in the community area or in the, the questions uh, to the support group. Uh, let us know how this is going, but basically just watch these things. And of course, take the challenge. And the challenge is go find a friend of somebody and sit down with them. You're not gonna do everything we just did, but just say, hey, what should we do about climate change? Poke some sliders, see what you can learn, start practicing engaging other people in using this to build up to the point where you can use it um, to engage others. Okay, for those for the hour, we'll see you next week. I hope you can join us uh, in the next meeting that we have. Goodbye and stick around if you'd like to continue with this next challenge. All right. So here's the last one. Participants are so bummed out. Did you see the temperatures in Oman and Pakistan? It hit 126 in Oman and Pakistan and the UAE. 
Here in the US, I know people in Portland, Oregon and Northwest, it, these heat waves have been breaking people's hearts beyond all the other things that are breaking our hearts. You're running a workshop and people are in that and you can see it on their faces and you think, what can I do? And not just what's a speech you can give, how can you use En-ROADS? What's a thing to do in En-ROADS that you think can help build hope and possibility? So we set up a poll. What, were, what did you hear? What was the most compelling that you heard? And we're really focusing here on using the simulator. There are so many things just in conversation that can be done, telling stories about why you have hope, telling stories about when you didn't and what helped you get it back, framings about what hope means. That's not what I'm asking here. We're really talking about things that you can do in the simulator. Here they come. Show how much cheaper renewables will be than other forms of energy. This is happening very soon, if not now. Renewable slider, cost is coming down. We have all the tools we need to keep under 1.5. Use the economics. Try to guide the participants to find their own position in the simulator. Show easy, not controversial solutions, increase renewables, electrification, transport, building infrastructure. So, so many pieces matter. Small changes will make a difference. Awareness generation, carbon price, just do it. Fantastic. At the end, being able to pull up examples of other groups, successful scenarios to show how people are getting at it in different ways. The US getting to finally invest massively in the world, in the climate, sharing information, show it is possible, empower people to use En-ROADS, show just more than the economic quality of life improvements, co-benefits, fantastic. How current legislation will affect or not. Okay, let's do some of these. Absolutely well said. People talked about renewables and some of the graphs that we particularly love, uh, even we just have one here, the model comparison. This is about confidence building, but it's so amazing. The people around the world who have worked so hard to bring the marginal cost of solar energy, carbon-free electricity. I took my first class in global warming in college in this year when it was 147 a kilowatt hour. Down, 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 down. It is now, what is that? Eight cents from a <laughs> from a dollar 47? Show these data. This is amazing that the solutions have gotten so inexpensive. And another graph here is that we have seen, this isn't just forecast, but this is what is actually happening. Look at that exponential growth in wind and solar. This is great news. What is expected to happen? There's another graph, which is the cost of electricity. Someone mentioned that in the poll just now. Down, 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 down. Here is that cost I just was talking about, but it was calling from 1990 to 2020, down, 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 and anticipated to keep going. Hooray, what great news. And that is leading this green wedge to get wider and wider. So that is really, really good news. And the co-benefits of that and some of the actions, particularly if we do more, people mentioned that, if we could imagine more with renewables and carbon price and energy efficiency and electrification, et cetera, what could be the co-benefits? And again, those co-benefits around air quality. We had a workshop a couple months ago where someone said, I just want my grandkids to have air that is clean as mine. Think about that. Breathe air as clean as mine. No, you don't. Our hair is terrible. It's <laughs> PM 2.5 emissions are way up here. They could be half as much around the world. Delhi, Beijing could be much cleaner. Mexico City, it could be much better. That is hope building. We could be aiming at a much better future. I'm gonna go back and look at your prompts before I get to the, the big one. No, that's not the big one. Uh, your prompts were here. Um, Co-benefits, 
empower people. It's possible. Carbon price is powerful. Small changes make a difference. Okay, I'm just going to then the main answer would be, I believe, and you've said it, give the simulator to people and show how it is possible. It is the core premise of the workshop or anything. When you sit with your roommate or your partner and say, let's see if you can create a scenario to get well below two degrees to get to or 1.5 and have them experience that it is possible. So in your exercise where you sit down with somebody, don't you just show it, show them how it works, say, here's how it goes. This is you click here, you click here, you click here, and then reset it and say, okay, see if you can do it. Give them the mouse and let them discover themselves and learn that it is still biogeochemically possible, economically possible to get to 2.6 or 2.5 or 2.3 or 2.0 or 1.9. Give them the experience of constructing a possible future. That builds hope. It's not a quick fix. It doesn't happen by you saying a sentence, but it creates that possibility because you can see, people can see for themselves a way out of the mess. It'll get them not thinking about Portland or Oman and 126 degrees. It'll get them thinking about a future that they wanna be part of. Now, of course, you know, you've seen the workshop videos, then you, Ask them to be silent for a minute and ask them, what would you love about this? Those are things that can nourish your capacity for hope. Ellie, anything else you saw in those answers that we would want to answer before we send people to breakout rooms? Uh, no, but I jumped around to a bunch of breakout rooms and I just caught little snippets of so many great conversations. So that was, that was really exciting to hear. Uh, I, I know there was so much more that was shared in the breakout rooms than what we could bring back to the, the main room. Great. So what you're going to do now, we're ending this, but we, God, we just love to have a chance. Two things are going to happen. One of them is you can stay here and ask us questions, or you can go to a breakout room. And this has a list, which are not the same breakout rooms. These rooms are going to be about education and research and business and public policy. But Join a group of people using this in a similar domain and meet them. And what the, the, the prompt is going to be, have everybody say their name and where they're from. Make sure if someone shows up late, make sure they have a chance to say their name and where they're from. And then share, here's where I'm using En-ROADS. I'm going to run a game. I'm going to show this to my boss. I'm going to take this to my community group, my class, whatever. Say what you're going to do with it or what you are doing with it and see if there's some synergies between your efforts. And the others are here. Yeah, and if you if you want to stick around and if you have a question for us that maybe we haven't gotten into, got, gotten to it yet, write it into the chat and um, we'll try and handle things. We got through a ton of questions over in the chat. Uh, me and Janet and the rest of the team were trying to answer as many as possible, but I know we missed some. So uh, feel free to write your Write, write whatever into the chat if um, if we missed your question. Um, Ron asks, are we going to Glasgow? We are trying to figure that out, Ron. Uh, Glasgow, of course, where COP is happening this year, uh, it has been totally uncertain as to what kind of travel openings there will be given uh, COVID. Um, we'd like to be, if we can find a way to be helpful, we have gone to many COPs in the past, but. We also have a team of people. There's a great network of ambassadors in the United Kingdom that are doing a lot of organizing around uh, COP2. So um, we, I know we have some people on the ground already that are working on all different kinds of engagements, building up kind of that, the UK community's awareness of everything around COP. Um, all right, let's see what co what's coming in here. Uh, all right, Drew, here's a, here's a tough one, perhaps, or a good question. You ready? Yeah, and this or, will be my last one. I have a 12 Yeah, you've got, you've got to run. Um, all right, yeah, so, so my last one, but Al Alice, Alice asks, um, what do you say to people who are anti-wind? Anti-wind? 
Yeah, she showed it to a friend, but the friend rejected inroads saying too much support for wind energy. I haven't seen that one come up, but I definitely know that there are people out there who don't like wind power. Wow. Isn't it funny that I have a meeting I got to go to. So Ellie, guess <laughs> what? <laughs> You're going to leave me. <laughs> All right, Drew. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, Drew left me with uh, holding, holding your question, Alice. And I, so one thing that, you know, I, I, I think I, you kind of have to come up with when you're talking to friends or family and they have a really strong opinion about anything is just to try and figure out where they're coming from. You know, what, if, you have a, if you have the chance to sit down with them and you have a good relationship with the person, just try and uh, learn more. And sometimes people just have, you know, strong beliefs and, and uh, it's, it's, it'll take, take time and you have to make the call as to whether it's worth your time to engage them over the long run. But, you know, I encourage people to share the facts. You know, I've heard around wind, you know, people have concerns about the birds, but then there are studies out there showing how coal-fired power plants and mountaintop removal from coal mining have really devastated biodiversity. So there's ways of kind of, well, we have to get our energy from somewhere and uh, balancing that out. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one. And, and Alice, feel free to keep us posted on how that goes, whether you're successful in engaging your friend or, or it's, uh, you're not getting anywhere. Um, all right, so we have, um, yeah, and Ron mentions, you know, one thing we have to factor in with all of these solutions, and this is where we also bring up, you know, it's really important as a facilitator to talk about equity considerations, because when we're using inroads, we're looking at things from the global scale. But of course, policy impacts people and communities. And so policy can be designed in ways that um, communities that have been historically marginalized or can further hurt them. And so when we talk about any kind of solution at such a large scale, oh, let's scale up renewable energy really fast, then like also challenging people, okay, if you're working on this at a local scale, what are the ways is, ways that it can help, uh, help you know, give people jobs that didn't have access to jobs before? Make sure it doesn't undermine uh, land sovereignty and, it, and challenges like that that plague so many um, uh, indigenous communities and local communities around the world, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see what other questions come in. And also, of course, remember you can join the breakout rooms. We have they're they're still open and active. Uh, I, I hope people are having good conversation. If you want to join a breakout room but haven't figured out how to get to one, just write into the chat and we'll um, we'll make sure to send you there. Um, um, all right. And uh, Janet or Yasmin, um, have you all seen in the chat any questions that we perhaps missed, um, but we wanna get to um, and touch on for those who are still hanging around or um, um, anything else out there? I saw one question earlier from someone, I forget. Uh, Steve, write your question back in if I missed it. <laughs> It's also hard to talk and read the chat. Um, this is a skill I have not mastered yet. So <laughs> it's, I know I'm missing things that are right in front of my eyes. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Steve's question was about the crop reduction aspect of reducing meat consumption. Um, so how can we show in the simulator that when we reduce meat consumption, it also reduces the need for um, crops for animal feed. I think that's your question, Steve. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And one I, we don't have well captured. However, I will say one of the, the biggest area that our modeling and tech team is working on right now um, is around the land sector. So there are, uh, you know, when we look at things like carbon removal, this could demand tons of land. You know, you plant a lot of trees. When you move that afforestation slider, how much land is being um, used? And is that land being taken away from land that could be used for agriculture? So we hope in the next, I don't think it'll be in the August release of En-ROADS at this point, but maybe in September, 
um, we'll release a whole new component to the modeling. Most of it will be under the hood. You won't notice any, any significant changes. However, in the land use emissions area, um, you will see kind of finer grain detail. And we hope what this kind of sets us up for is also to get more sophisticated too in uh, some of the sliders that we can uh, put on inroads around things like diets and different changes around the food system because they're so important. And uh, so many people are curious about it. Really what motivates uh, a lot of how we choose what to add into inroads is where people are talking about things um, and how can we create a tool that is relevant to uh, different uh, discussions that people are having within the climate space. That's why a month or so ago, we added clean electricity standard because particularly in, in the United States right now, a lot of people are talking about the clean electricity standard um, and trying to figure out, okay, how does this fit? If we had a global clean electricity standard, how would that fit into the uh, uh, you know, temperature change and that kind of thing? Uh, Ron asks, have you, have you watched Kiss the Ground? I have watched Kiss the Ground. I did not fact check it um, and check all their numbers as I went through it, but it was fascinating just the stories that are told in that film about regenerative agriculture. And that's certainly also one of those areas that there's a lot of buzz and interest around. And it's included within inroads in um, to some extent. You can look under, let me just, uh, I can share my screen perhaps now that Drew is gone. All right. Um, so if you go under technological carbon removal and then you scroll through, use detailed settings, then we have agricultural soil carbon sequestration. So when we move this slider, what we're doing is increasing the amount of soil carbon that stays, uh, the amount of carbon that stays in the soil. Um, and that is definitely a huge component when we talk about uh, regenerative agriculture and all the practices, things like no-till agriculture um, being, you know, using cover crops when possible. There's a whole number of different practices that are kind of, um, subsumed under this umbrella uh, that are really fascinating. And um, there's, there's been a lot of conversation around. So if you scale up agricultural soil carbon sequestration within inroads, you can see down here on the right, my, the graph we're showing here, it scales up to about five gigatons per year. Um, and so that is a contributor and can help remove some of that carbon. One of the big considerations around this too is making sure that that carbon stays in the soil. So we see places, um, actually, I believe there was a study, I haven't read it yet, but there's news this week about how um, the Amazon, which of course has a great power of sequestering carbon, is becoming a source of releasing carbon. As you get uh, changes in climate, uh, you get things decomposing and drying out and that releases carbon to the atmosphere. So definitely when we're counting on carbon for biological systems, when we're counting on that carbon to stay on the ground, we need to also factor in and think about the ways in which, how can that carbon stay there permanently? Because say, if you plant a tree and you expect it to sequester carbon, but then that tree is cut down 20 years later, it, the success of which uh, its ability to store carbon is then compromised. Um, why don't we wrap it up here though? We have gone 36 minutes after the hour. Uh, let me go, let me try and get back to Zoom here. Um, and, yeah, why don't we close out the breakout rooms? Uh, a few of you all hanging on here in the main room. Um, or Janet, is there something else I should touch on? But Yazzie, why don't you give people in the breakout rooms kind of a two minute warning and uh, then we'll pull everyone back here and wrap up for the day. Janet, any other things I should touch on? I think we've answered um, most of the questions. Um, I see a great question from um, Isnan, sorry if I mispronouncing the name, about um, kind of having more visualizations in En-ROADS because for a lot of people, graphs are helpful, but not necessarily um, the most intuitive or easy to understand. Um, and this is very timely. We are um, soon, I think Ellie might've mentioned this, um, adding maps of sea level rise to En-ROAD so that people can look at maps and see the effect on sea level rise of their scenario. Um, so we are really trying to think this through a bit more. Um, so thanks for the question. It's kind of a good reminder that um, we are trying to, 
make this tool as accessible as possible. And if you have ideas about that, um, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And welcome back from the breakout groups. I hope those were fruitful conversations. Um, we'll keep doing this. Um, sounds like it, for those who can stick around, uh, I've seen a lot of people enjoying the breakout rooms. I also like to connect with you all and meet you all in these breakout rooms. But I think we're going to wrap it up here for today. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoy the videos and all the quizzes. We worked really hard on the quizzes. <laughs> and um, I'll see you next week at the same time, same place. Uh, until then, take care of yourselves. Bye, everyone.